Hello everyone, welcome to today's video. This is the final part in the economic series that I've been making for you. In the first five parts, I discussed various economic concepts. For example, I talked about demand and supply and how prices of different goods and services get determined. Then I talked about why these prices rise, why inflation happens and what is the effect that inflation has on our investments, our wealth. Then I talked about GDP, what does GDP signify and whether it is a true measure of the health of the economy or not. Then finally, I discussed about interest rates and debt to GDP ratio and how it signifies the stability of an economy. And then I discussed exchange rate, how world trade happens, what are the factors that influence exchange rates and how exchange rates can be manipulated. So this is what the first five parts were about. Now, on this video, I'm going to link all these concepts together to help you understand the macroeconomic picture of any economy. I'm going to give you a very, very neat story so that you can understand how economic cycles function, how GDP increases, decreases, and then increases. This will give you a deeper appreciation of how different economies go through bad phases and good phases. I will also talk about why stock markets do not always go in parallel to the economic cycles. This is what the agenda for today is. So let's start the video. Before that, a quick introduction about myself. I'm Ayushi. I'm an Indian Economic Service Officer currently working with the Government of India. I have over seven years of experience working at the intersection of finance, economics and public policy. I'm here to simplify complex economics financial terms for you so that you can understand how economies function, how different factors affect your daily life. This is what my agenda is. So without further delay, let's start the video. At the very start, I would like to say that if you haven't watched the first five parts of the video, then do watch it because it will give you a deeper understanding about different concepts that I'm going to talk about in this video. It will not take you a lot of time. One and a half hours, you can complete the entire five parts and this will help you understand today's video at a much deeper level. So if you're already aware of those terms, no problem at all. Let's continue with this video. So let's start the story. In this story, we call the country, let's say country perfecto. Now, country perfecto is growing. It is showing some GDP growth rate. So, there is some GDP growth rate happening. People are employed. Employment is there. Goods and services are being produced. And to produce those goods and services, people need to be employed. So, people are employed. GDP growth rate is happening. And if people are employed, that means they're also getting income in their wallets. This means the income is rising and when they get income in their wallet, they have some money in their hands at their disposal to spend on goods and services. They start demanding goods. This means that the demand is rising. Now, let's say that the demand is rising rapidly, but the supply is not being able to match by it. So, the demand rises, but the supply is not getting matched. So, the demand is much more than the supply. What will this lead to? We have already discussed this when we discussed about inflation. This is a situation wherein a lot of money is chasing very little goods and hence the prices of those goods start rising so that only people who can actually afford it can buy it. So this means that there is a general price rise in the economy. Prices rise. This means that there is inflation in the economy. Now, what does this inflation lead to? Now, inflation means that there is a price rise all across the board. This means that food is becoming expensive, electronic goods are becoming expensive, travel is becoming expensive. There is inflation happening all across. This means that people would not be able to consume the same amount of goods that they initially could because the prices of those goods have risen. For example, if I could buy 100 rupees worth of mangoes at a certain stage, now because mangoes have become more expensive and my income remains the same, I will not be able to purchase the same amount of mangoes, right? So with those 100 rupees, I'll be able to purchase only lesser number of mangoes. This means that people will become fearful. Fear is setting in that the inflation will continue to rise. Now, an important point to note here is that inflation or price rise is self-fulfilling.
This means that inflation leads to more inflationary expectations. For example, let us assume that presently the prices of four apples is 100 rupees. Now inflation has set in. We already know that numbers are being reflected on news channels. Government is saying that, that there is inflation. What will happen? I will think that inflation is going to continue for some time. And this may lead to a situation where the prices of those apples increases even further. So what am I going to do? I am going to say that, you know, I'll buy more apples today only so that I have to pay lesser amount than tomorrow when the prices are going to rise further. So I'm going to start buying more apples today. This means that the demand for apples is going to increase. And this is going to be true for a large section of the population. So as and when demand increases, again, prices start rising further and inflation goes into a spiral. And this can lead to a situation of hyperinflation. This is something which I've already discussed. And this is a very, very, very dangerous situation because there can be a situation where the inflation cannot be controlled at all. And hence, the economy's currency completely devalues, it becomes nothing, there is no value, and then economic collapse of the country can also happen, which has happened in certain economies. We have already seen that. So this is a very dangerous situation. So inflationary expectations are self-fulfilling. A certain inflation in the economy can lead to more inflation in the economy. So it is a very, very dangerous situation. And the same is true for price fall, that is deflation as well. Let's say that today the prices of those apples is 100 rupees, but there is deflation in the economy. Government is also saying that, government is saying that, you know, prices are falling, which is a good thing for the economy. But I say that, you know, instead of buying apples today, why don't I buy it tomorrow when the prices will fall further? Because there is already deflation in the economy. So I postpone my decision to consume that good today. I say that I'll consume it tomorrow or later. And hence, the demand is going to fall from the supply. Demand will be less than the supply and the prices of those apples will keep on decreasing. And once the prices of those apples keep on decreasing, it may be true for other goods as well. Deflation sets in and this also goes into a spiral. This is again very dangerous because if there is no consumption, then how will the economy grow? What are the factories and the companies going to sell their produce to? And this means that this is also a very dangerous situation. So the ideal balance is somewhere between inflation rate being around 2 to 3%, which is considered to be decent. India targets inflation rate at 4%. However, anything beyond that can lead to a serious situation of hyperinflation. Anything below that means that there is deflationary tendencies and again, it needs some intervention by the government. So let's come back to the story. Now, inflationary expectations have set in, people have become fearful. They assume that inflation is going to be higher tomorrow and hence they start consuming more and more today. This means that the demand is going to rise. But once they see that inflation is here to stay, they start consuming only essential goods and they stop consumption of all other goods that they can avoid today. And this means that the aggregate demand in the economy would now start falling. So people spend only on essential goods. The demand for other goods, demand for other goods starts falling. What does this mean? If demand is less than the supply, then the companies and factories will see an inventory piling up. They will not be able to sell their products and the inventory will start piling up. This means that the prices will start reducing. To an extent, it leads to a situation of deflation. That means there is a general price fall in the economy. And once prices start falling, people, some of the people would again start consuming more. So demand is again going to start rising demand will rise more and the cycle will continue. If you look at this graph, the economic cycle works somewhat in this way. So there will be a situation wherein economic growth is happening, employment is happening, income is rising, so people start consuming more, but then inflation sets in and people start consuming less. They consume less to a point wherein the demand falls, there is deflationary tendencies, and then again, when prices fall, certain people will start demanding more, which will lead to an increase in prices again, inflation will set in, growth will happen. Again, this cycle will continue. So economic cycle is something cyclical. This is what an economic cycle looks like. Of course, I try to introduce this term to you in a very, very simplified manner. There can be other factors at play, which uh, we haven't discussed in this video, but this is something which will give you a broad understanding of how economic cycles work. Now, how long the cycle is going to be or how, uh, much in recession or depression the country is going to be, how much the GDP is going to increase or fall is something which cannot be predetermined. 
people can of course extrapolate the historical data and try to find a solution to that but this is not something which anybody can predict completely so economic cycles though cyclical in nature but how long this economic cycle will continue and what will be the depth or the height of that cycle cannot be determined right so another factor here is that this cycle that i discussed was when everything is left to the market but government also intervenes to prevent any kind of deep troughs from happening in the economic cycle so deep troughs are basically these periods of downfall or recession so this is called as the crest when the gdp is booming and this is called as the trough when gdp is falling so this will be a situation of uh, recession and depression and this will be a situation of recovery and boom so this is basically in to prevent this kind of or this kind of situation from happening governments intervene so how do they intervene when prices are rising they increase the interest rate when they increase the interest rate the money supply in the economy falls watch the video on interest rates and i have discussed this thing in detail there so money supply falls there is less cash in the hands of the people and again people start consuming less prices fall and again the prices are stabilized this is how governments intervene in order to prevent any kind of uh, inflation or in any kind of depletion from happening in the economy with me so far but when interest rates rise another thing happens they start saving with their money they start investing in bonds because they are able to get a higher return there they also start saving their money in savings account and hence money flows into bonds and savings similarly if the interest rate falls then a lot of money is poured out from the bonds into the stock market because stock markets and now cryptos also they are acting as good alternatives to invest money outside bonds and the savings accounts so this is what is happening in the current situation stock markets do not necessarily move in tandem with the economic cycle because they are guided by a number of factors so let us look at those factors quickly the first factor is that stock markets are forward looking that is when you are buying stocks what does it mean it means that you are buying into a company and you expect that company to perform good in the near future or in the uh, long term horizon this means that these are forward looking you expect that company to perform good and fetch you higher profits in the long term so this is forward looking however economy or gdp if you look at gdp it gives you a real picture of what has happened in the past so it will give you data on the things that have happened and this will be backward looking so there is one difference here the second difference is related to what stock markets represent stock markets usually is measured by nifty 50 so stock markets represent only certain corporates and their profits however gdp is the sum of different sectors agriculture sector manufacturing sector service sector right so gdp is a broad broad thing stock markets is only a small representation of the entire economy so that is the second difference there the third difference comes with interest rates so when the interest rates are high a lot of investors would start pouring in their money in bonds when interest rates falls the money flows out from bonds into stocks this is a major factor which determines the rise and fall of stock markets of course this is not the only factors there are multiple other factors as well but this is a major factor so this is also to be considered that the same thing may not apply to gdp if interest rates are rising this means that prices are falling and hence gdp may start falling but if interest rates are falling gdp may start rising so this has a more broader perspective stock markets is a very very small proportion of the entire economy the fourth factor is something called as animal spirits i discussed this in my last video as well but animal spirits are basically the human emotions stock markets are affected by human emotions 
any news regarding any political turmoil or any news regarding any new scheme introduced by the government or any other factor for example even the pandemic that started in 2020 led to a sudden fear among the investors and they started withdrawing their money from india and started investing it outside india because india is not considered to be a very stable market because its debt to gdp ratio is high the inflation is high and all these factors i have already discussed but the point is that human emotions also determine what happens to the stock market so for example in 2020 when the pandemic struck stock markets fell suddenly because there was a sudden virus which had come all across the globe and people were scared they did not know what to do with their money they started saving that money they did not want to invest it anywhere but when they saw that the situation started improving when the interest rates were decreased by several governments across the global economy to incentivize people to spend more because demand had fallen people started investing that money the extra money they had into stock markets interest rates had fallen the bonds were no longer attractive and they started pouring that money into stock markets so human emotions actually guide stock markets to a very very large extent the point of the matter is that in the short term there might be a wide variation in how gdp is performing and how stock markets are performing however in the long term both of them converge towards the same direction so if i have to put it in the form of a drawing if the economic cycle looks something like this then the stock market cycle would look something like this so there is greater volatility in the stock market cycle however gdp cycle is somewhat less volatile so these are the differences between gdp cycle and the stock market cycle stock market cycles are determined by a number of factors it is only a small representation of the entire economy it shows only the corporate profits it also is guided by human emotions or what we call as animal spirits in economics the stock market was rising in india because of a number of factors which was sudden inflow of money because of lower interest rates people started withdrawing the money from the bonds and into the stock market there was also seen to be a large number of Uh, account openings dmat account openings because of digitization which aided the process so there were a number of factors there but this is what the difference is between gdp cycles and stock market cycles in the short term both might be diverging but in the long term they are going to converge in the same direction i hope you found this video to be useful if you like this video then do press the like button i'll be discussing more concepts around economics finance and public policy in my future videos this is where i end the video and uh, if you have any suggestions for me then please do comment them in the comment box down below i'll be happy to look at those and make videos around that and i'm also planning to prepare some case studies so do give me ideas regarding that with this i'll close out the video thank you so much see you the next time take care stay safe bye